great. <laughs> well, if you have your Bibles with you, you may ask you to turn with me to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9 this morning. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, just two verses this morning, entitled my sermon, Our Great Christmas Gift, Our Great Christmas Gift. What would you say was the greatest gift, uh, Christmas gift you ever got, you ever received? Or the greatest gift, period. Well, as a child of God, I'd have to say it is salvation. It is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in my heart. That's the greatest gift. In fact, that is Christmas to me. The gift of God's Son. The gift that God gave us. And this Christmas season is all about God giving us that great gift. God, God not... Uh, did not have to send the Savior. God did not have to give his son. But because of the love that he has for you and I, and that magnificent love for us, he did so. He gave his son for undeserving sinners. And Christmas means that he descended that we might ascend. He was born that we might be born again. He was a servant, or became a servant that we may become sons and daughters. He was forsaken that we might not be forsaken. And he died that we might live. So he came down that we might be caught up. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians that it is an incredible gift. Why? Because he gave himself as a gift, incorruptible, unblemished, without sin, an everlasting imperishment or imperishable gift for you and I. So this gift was a prophecy made some 700 years before it ever took place. But it became a reality in the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And today we are here actually looking at the historical events uh, that, that are really the pivotal points of human history. It is a point in time in history that's made all the world of difference. Let's look at those verses 6 and 7. It says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Let us pray. Father in heaven, again, as we come to your throne, we want to thank you, Lord, for this day. We want to thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be together, to assemble in your house of worship. Father, we pray for those who could not be here for whatever reason. Lord, bless them. Bring them back the next appointed hour. But Lord, thank you for this day and this opportunity. And Lord, as we do get into this Christmas season, this week we celebrate the birth of the Christ child. Let us truly hold in our hearts what it's all about. And that is a Savior came to earth for undeserving sinners such as I. Greatest gift of all. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. My first point here is this, the description of this great gift. He is God-man. It is the God-man. Both he is humanity and he is deity. And he was predicted some 700 years before it ever happened by the prophets and by the prophet Isaiah. The words, a child is born, refers to the Messiah's humanity. Uh, this describes his birth as a baby, his humanity as a man. He will come to earth as a child and born through the conception of a woman by the Holy Spirit of God. And the words of a, of a son, in other words, the words a son is given, points to the deity of Jesus. Jesus is God's son given as a gift. The child's being uh, uh, given indicate that in some special way God himself would send the child into the world. And the words a son refers back to Isaiah 7, 14 where it in indicates that Emmanuel, which is himself, God with us, will come to earth as the Messiah. God with us. How wonderful thought that is, God with us. Jesus came into the world as an infant through the wound of a virgin, but he has existed for eternity as God's son, 
whom the Father gave for a sacrifice for you and I. This child given with, uh, uh, was birthed uh, in Bethlehem, and, and, and it's a town called uh, 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 the House of Bread. And this gift, the eternal Son of God, for you and I, for us, that's amazing love if you think about it. That's wonderful love. It's amazing love. It's a wonderful love that uh, it can be found nowhere else but in Christ Jesus, in God, coming to earth for you and I. Also, his name describes who he is. It says here in Isaiah <clears throat> that he had to, use, in other words, he used multiple titles in sharing with us about the character of the Messiah. Our great Christmas gift is the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. Now the phrase here and his name, notice that, his name shall be called, uh, means he, he will justly bear these names. So technically, uh, what it's saying here is describing as his name is all this. It's not his names, it's not, it's not got the S on it, names, but his name, this is his name. All these things make up who he is. So again, how wonderful you think about that, what it takes to describe him. So let's look at the first part there, the wonderful counselor. That title means a wonder of a counselor. The word wonderful means full of wonder and glory and exception, astonishment and extraordinary. The wisest of all kings was Solomon. But now the Bible tells us here we have one that is wiser and greater than Solomon. It is that royal baby that is born in Bethlehem in the house of bread. He is the wisdom of God. And the point that we need to make is that our Savior is a wonderful counselor, not just because he's, he's in heaven right now speaking up for us and defending <laughs> us, but also because he is in our hearts speaking to us, directly to us. How wonderful that is that we have a counselor in our heart through the Holy Spirit of God to talk with us, to, to lead us, to guide us. He is a wonderful counselor. Christ lives as a, lived as a man, bearing all the trials and temptations of humanity. He even suffered in incomprehensible uh, persecution and was eventually executed as a criminal. And due to all of his intense suffering and everything that he went through, that makes him the most emphatic counselor imaginable. So in other words, he knows what it's like to endure pain. He knows what it's like to be hungry and thirsty and experience poverty and homelessness. He knows the feeling of being rejected, even by his own. So that, too, makes him eligible to be that wonderful counselor. He knows whatever you're going through right now, whatever's happening in your family, in your life, God knows all about it, and I want you to know you just need to lean on him. Lean not to your own understanding, but lean on him because he's the great and wonderful counselor. He knows what you're going through. Amen. Praise God for that. So such, such are the experiences that confronted so many of us as we live in our lives. That those, we, we, we need a counselor. We need Christ, and, and he's that one person who, who feels what we feel. He stands before us as that wonderful counselor. He is the one person who can comfort us, who can give us uh, solid guidance about how to handle every problem that we face. We just need to look to him. He's that counselor. As the wonderful counselor, Christ can guide, encourage, strengthen us to conquer whatever trials, whatever temptations may confront us, whatever may come our way. And also as a wonderful counselor, he will teach us how to walk victoriously throughout life. He is that counselor. His counsel will be right. You ever got any wrong counsel before? I think we all have. You ever gave any wrong counsel? I think we all have. But I want you to know this, his counsel is right. You just go to his word. Go to, go to the Lord in prayer. Go to his word and you'll get the right counsel. It's never wrong, never having to wonder if it's good counsel or not. It is good counsel, amen? Also, in it, his counsel will also be relevant. In other words, uh, Jesus promised to be in us and with us through the person of his spirit forever. And this means that he is walking in our shoes, seeing what we are seeing, hearing what we are hearing, and feeling what we are feeling. So uh, his uh, advice is always relevant. 
And, and so because he knows right where we are, we can count on his guidance. Now think about that. Being living inside of you, he knows what you're facing. He knows what you're going through. And so he is the best one to counsel you. Amen? Amen. 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 He's the best one to look to for counsel. But also his counsel is always reliable. The Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth. That's what the Bible says. It is the spirit of truth. In other words, the advice we will receive from the Lord who resides within us will always be truthful, not sugar-coated, and not condescending. In other words, he will always tell us, tell us like it is. And that's what we all need, amen? amen. We, all, we need to be told like it is. Amen. He will be truthful in convincing us about what we should do, and he will be truthful in convicting us about what we should not do. Praise God for the Holy Spirit. Also, is the wonderful one in you, in you. Is that wonderful counselor in you today? I, I want to say this. If, 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 if that wonderful counselor is not in you today, then you're not truly and never have truly experienced what Christmas is all about. You need that wonderful counselor inside you. But not only is he a wonderful counselor, the Bible says that he is mighty God. That word mighty means strong one, strong one. In other words, there's nobody else any stronger. He's the strong one. He's the powerful one. He's that violent warrior. In Isaiah 9, that adjective there, mighty, literally means the God hero. That's what it means. So this facet of his name tells us Jesus is not only the son of God, he is also God the son. The baby born in the feeding trough is the king of glory. Or to say it another way, the humble carpenter of Nazareth is also the mighty architect of the universe. As God, he is omnipotent. In other words, he's all powerful. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipresent. In other words, he's everywhere. So you can't get away with anything either. Amen? Amen. He knows He's all powerful and he's everywhere. We can pull the wool off, uh, you know, we, we, can, we can fool other people, but we can't fool him. We can hide from other people, but we can't hide from him. We can convince people of, uh, of wrongful things, but we can't him. He knows all. Amen. Amen. He is the mighty God. He is able to save any who cry out to him for salvation. As the mighty God, he has the power and the knowledge to rescue people from all trials and temptation. He has the power to deliver people from any bondage of, of any kind of oppression, whether due to some uh, enemy or to some personal addiction or whatever. He has that power. I was reading, <clears throat> I like this, I come across a great illustration, this Missionary was over in China. This is when the communists were starting to take over years ago. And the communists took over China. And, 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 and this missionary there was, was terrified. It was a woman. And she was trying her best to get out of China. And she feared for her life. And this 13-year-old girl says to her, says, Remember, remember what you told us about Moses. She said, Yes, child, but I'm not Moses. The little girl said, no, but God's still God. Amen. That's exactly right. God's still God. Amen. Amen. That's right. We don't have to have a big name. We don't have to be, a, a, you know, what that, that one that, that has been in the Bible and his name's all in the Bible. We don't have to be a Billy Graham. God still knows you, knows where you are, and he's still God. Amen. And he can help you. He wants to help you. Indeed, God is still God, and he has the power and the desire to guide you through the difficulties of life if you only allow him to do so. If you only will trust him. That's what the Bible says. Trust and obey. Do you know that, that almighty God? And I started asking you, is, is that wonderful counselor living in you, counseling you? And now I'm asking you, do you know that almighty God? Have you allowed him to fight the battles for you that you cannot win any other way. 
Have you cast your burdens on him because he cares for you? Have you allowed him to clothe you in the almightiness to, to make you strong in his strength? You see, friend, Jesus can manage anything because he is almighty. He healed the lame, the blind, and the sick. He calmed the storms. He brought Lazarus back from the grave. He can do anything. Amen? Amen. Anything. Anything. Therefore, he can do the impossible in your life right now. Whatever you think is impossible in your life, he can do it. Whatever you think is just totally impossible, can't happen, just trust the Lord. Because I want to tell you something. I, don't get, I, I was up quite a bit last night. You can tell I'm sick. But I want to tell you something. Yesterday, I could not preach. I was up half the night and said, Lord, I've got to preach tomorrow. Please help me. I coughed all day long last night, yesterday. Half the night, I said, Lord, I'm counting on you. And since I started preaching, I ain't coughed yet. Now, I might cough in a minute. But what I'm saying is I trust the Lord to help me get through this. So he's the mighty God. Let him fight your battles. Let him be your holy hero. We all need him. Worship him as your warrior and praise him as the power of all glory. Not only that, he's the everlasting father. That literally, uh, father of eternity is what it means. All his plans and purposes are everlasting and eternal. Now and forever, he is a father, provider. He is a protector. He's the shepherd. He is everything that you need in your life. He's everything. He's the everlasting father. The baby born in the manger is, for, is your forever father who cares about you and cares about you with everlasting compassion. Psalms 103.13 says the father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Everlasting father describes a king and a father who provides for and protects his people forever. He is an everlasting father. He's always there. Amen? Amen. He will always be there for you. And he's the only one that can say that. And he's the only one that you can trust in to be there too. Because guess what? My earthly father's gone. But my heavenly father's still here. Amen. And many of you say the same thing. You can always trust he's here. He's the everlasting father. He is the everlasting father. You are eternally secure in him too. I like that. You see, no one can take you out of his hand. You know, I like that scripture where it talks about nobody can pluck you out of his hand. I like that. I, I love that. You know what I like to do with that verse? Quite often, I like to rub that in Satan's face. <laughs> I like to rub it. That's a great verse to throw at him. Just rub it in his face. He can't, you, Satan, you can't take me out of the Lord's hand. You can do a lot of things, but you can't take me away from my Heavenly Father. I'm eternally secure and safe in the hands of Jesus. Praise God. I'm in those nail-scarred hands, and Satan can't do anything about it. Amen. But grumble. He will care for his people. He will nourish them. He will nurture them. He will comfort them. He will secure them, instruct them, inform them, lead them, guide them, correct them, and discipline them too also when he needs to. We don't like that word, but you know sometimes we need it. Discipline. There's times when we need discipline. We're children too, his children. The next thing is he is the prince of peace. Now this phrase prince of peace can be translated the prince who's Coming brings peace. And the Messiah is bringing peace to the human heart. He solves the problem of mankind being alienated from God. He reconciles people to God. And when people are reconciled to God, they, they, have, play, they have peace, in other words, in their heart. Now, that's the only way to have peace. <clears throat> Most people think about peace is, is without war. That's not true. You see, the only way to have peace and that satisfying peace is to have Jesus Christ in your heart. That's the peace that you need. That's the peace that, that, that assures you uh, of eternal salvation. That's the peace that comforts you no matter the circumstances that's going on around you. You need that peace of God. Amen? Amen. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of Peace. He reconciles people. To God, and when people are reconciled to God, they have peace with God. 
They walk through life with the full assurance that their sins are forgiven and they are accepted by God. Jesus comes into our depression with the promise of peace within. Hmm. I'm going to tell you something. You know what our world needs today? Peace. Did you know that between 1959 and 2016, life expectancy in the United States rose from 69.9 to 78.9 years? It rose that much. But did you know that since then, it's reversed course? You see, a new study paints a picture of a society in deep trouble. For the last five years in a row, the average life expectancy in the United States has declined. The Washington Post article described the cause behind the dramatic shift are things like suicide, drug overdose, liver disease from drugs and alcohol, and many lives are lost before they barely begin. Aren't they? We need to get the word out that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He is the hope for a troubled heart. The angelic uh, adoration that we see in Luke chapter 2 verse 14 is glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. You see, that decline has come about because people are not looking uh, for that peace in the right place. You see, uh, men are dying and people are dying because they're trying to find joy and happiness and satisfaction and drugs and alcohol and everything else but what they need to look to, and that's God. Amen? Amen. When you get high on Jesus, there's no side effects. <laughs> Well, let me just say, there's no bad side effects. Right. There's no bad side effects. Right? Like, like good side effects. Hmm. Friend, are you out of sorts with God? All you got to do is look to the Prince of Peace. Ask him into your heart. Ask him into your life. If you're all shaken up on the inside and, and you're just disturbed and, and, and here it is Christmas and you don't feel like Christmas, then look to the one that is the Prince of Peace. Look at, to the one that, 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 that Christmas is all about. It's the Christ child. And get that peace. You need to give him all your anxieties. Give him all the trouble and chaos in your life and he'll bring calm. Give your sins to him and enjoy the freedom from bondage. You see, this people need peace. <clears throat> it's a story told at the end of the war of 1812 that Andrew Jackson led a famous battle that never should have been fought. He led his riflemen, his, his frontier riflemen, to defeat a group of British troops down to north, uh, toward New Orleans, New Orleans. But you see, it was a battle that should have never been fought because, ironically, a peace treaty had already been signed days earlier, but word hadn't got to Andrew Jackson or the British. <laughs> You see, there's a lot of wars being fought in people's hearts and minds and lives that don't need to be fought because Jesus doesn't win the battle on Calvary. Amen. All you got to do is give your heart and life to him. You see, you don't need to be fighting those battles when he's done won the victory for you. All you need to do is come to him and seek forgiveness and he'll give you that peace that you need in your heart. Peace does not mean to be in a place where there's no noise or trouble or hard work. Peace means to be in the midst of all these things and still be calm in the heart. You know, it's kind of like that picture. <coughs> it's a picture. I coughed it. Sure did. It's kind of like that picture of a great big old waterfall. 
And over the top of that waterfall is just a storm and it's raging. And that waterfall, that water is just rushing. And it just seems like everything but peace. But as you look closely, you can see through the waterfall. And there in the cracks of the rocks is a branch grown out. And there on that branch is a bird nest. Sitting on that bird nest is a mother. In perfect calm. You see, that's what it is with Jesus. Though the world around you may be crazy, you can have that peace. Amen. That's right. That calm. In the midst of all the storm and all the raging that's going on around you. In the midst of all this anger that the, the world is throwing at us, Jesus can give you that perfect peace. My next main point, the authority of this great gift. The government shall be upon him. The government will be upon his shoulders, which means that he will have the indiscretion Beautiful right to govern. He will set his shoulders to the task of ruling his people and the world. He will not shriek from the duty he has been given by the Father as the exalted Lord. He will rule as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now he's coming again to this earth. We're celebrating his first coming. That's what Christmas is about. But he's coming back. The first time he came as a savior to die, the next time he comes, he will be king to conquer. And it's sad how the world treats him today, but one day all will bow at his feet. Even those who said we have no king but Caesar in John chapter 19, 15, they will bow before him in his honor and exaltation. He will rule with righteousness and justice. Imagine a world in which there is no lawlessness and no violence, no prejudice, no intolerance, no injustice or unrighteousness whatsoever. Imagine that, and that's Jesus coming back. The government shall be upon his shoulders, it says. God has promised the Messiah will rule in peace and sit upon David's throne. And he will rule forever, and what a day that will be, amen? I'm looking forward to that. It is guaranteed by the zeal of God. I, I like that in verse 7. Look what it says. Of the increase of his government, peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. There's a burning passion that floods the heart of God, a passion to make absolute sure the promise of the coming Messiah will be fulfilled. Nothing could have prevented the, the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. Some 700 years after that prophecy, the prediction happened, the Messiah came, and he's coming back. He arose from the grave, and he ascended to the Father, but I want you to know he's coming back, and we can count on it. And there's no better way to celebrate Christmas than to look forward to the Lord coming again. Amen. He's coming back. It will be fulfilled. Jesus, the Messiah, came the first time to save the world. So will he come the second time to sit upon the eternal throne of David and to judge the world. This prophecy is guaranteed, again, by the zeal of the Lord. Hmm. The question is, this Christmas, are you ready for him to come again? Are you ready for the Lord to come again? Are you ready for it to happen again? He's returning to this world not as the Lamb of God, but as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's returning not to die, but to reign, not to suffer, but to put down evil, and to rule the world. No wonder his name is above all names. No wonder his name at every, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. No wonder the forces of darkness shudder at the mention of his name. Friend, today, if you will put your faith in him, if you will trust in him, you can receive the greatest gift ever given to anyone. Eternal life. The gift of Christ is a personal gift for God to us. 
For the gift is not a gift unless you receive it. Embrace it for yourself and make it your personal thing. You see, that tiny hands of that baby Jesus was made to pick up, to take on those great big nails. And those tiny feet were made to walk up that mountain called the skull. And be nailed to the cross. His delicate head was made for that crown of thorns, and his tender body was wrapped in swollen clothes. Was made to be pierced by the spear. Folks, this is the Christmas gift. For unto us a child is born, and that child is Jesus Christ, the living Son of God, who was born of a virgin lived a sinless life, died a criminal's death on a bloody cross, rose again on the third day from the, uh, from the dead and sits reigning on the right-hand side of the Father right now in heaven. And he is the true king and shepherd of Israel. And in him alone, in him alone is to be found the peace mankind needs and mankind seeks. So I want to ask you this morning, do you know this king? Do you know who I'm talking about this morning? Is he, this morning, your counselor? Is he, this morning, that Prince of Peace, the everlasting Father and the mighty God in your life? Is he? Because without it, without him, you don't know what life's all about. You don't know the joys of life yet. I promise you. You ask any child of God, and they'll tell you, life is all about him. Brother Larry, would you come? Will you stand this morning? What are we singing, brother? Page 602. 602. Have decided to follow Jesus. <clears throat> if God's speaking to your heart, will you come this morning?